south of the border Down Mexico way That's where I fell in love When the stars above came out to play And now as I wander Hello there, all you expat wannabes. I'm Johnny Mueller, and you're listening to The Expat Files, Living in Latin America, the show that tells you just what it's like to live, work, play, and or retire down here in Latin America. It's a mix of the good, the bad, the ugly, and the great, and it's all right here, so let's get started. All right, we've got a very interesting email from Carvin, C-A-R-V-E-N. Oh, and by the way, I'm using this new microphone I mentioned a couple of shows ago. I think I've got it adjusted fairly good now. Haven't had any complaints yet, except someone said it's a little bassy. Let me know. Send me an email, files at gmail.com. Anyway, Carvin says, Johnny, my plan B is in high gear. I hope to be out of Dodge by the time the vaccine is mandatory. Then I'll be somewhere in Central America, probably Guatemala. Though I'm not taking the vaccine unless airlines force me into it. And like you said, Johnny, in an earlier show, that probably won't come till... Midsummer. I read that Qantas Airlines out of Australia has already said they're going to force vaccines on everyone or you just can't fly. So that news got my plan B on steroids and I'll be out of here well before summertime. Was hoping to make it down to your January seminar, but I just can't. I'll be at your summer one if you have one. Aside from that, I want to tell you about a coincidence. We have a Chicago connection. Here's the coincidental part, Johnny. I work or worked for 23 years in the Cook County, Illinois Water Department. In the Midwest, all the cities that surround the Great Lakes get their drinking water from one of the Great Lakes, Lake Michigan in the case of Chicago. So, Johnny, working at the very entity that supplies all the drinking water for Chicago, I'm totally on board with you being finicky about drinking tap water. I don't drink it, and none of my colleagues, and there are dozens of us in the lab, drink the water straight from the tap. We all purify our own. A lot of us have Berkey filters, which are really expensive British alternatives to the filter you talk about using and the one you put together and have a a report you've been given out. And you're right, glass and stainless steel are the only way to store your water. Unless, of course, you're continuously making it in real time and then you drink it. But to store it, even in the refrigerator, you should be using stainless steel or glass. All of us guys in the department and the chemists know that plastic is continuously getting into the water. Don't be fooled. Just because a bottle or plastic says free of BPA, the chemical bisphenol A, that's been shown to accumulate in people's bodies and decrease sperm counts, etc. The alternatives are not as safe as you think. And if you work intimately with water, like I have for the last 22 years, there is a little something that comes up that the average water drinker, even bottled water drinker, that never even crosses their minds. And I'm sure it's even more of an issue in Latin America than it is here in the States. I'm talking about when people wash their dishes. Everyone washes them with water out of the tap, then they set them out to dry. That's where the problem lies, because when water evaporates, it leaves behind all the solid particulates and solubles. So there's always a microscopically thin layer of particles and contaminants on your forks and knives, etc., And though you may have used chlorinated water and detergents, etc., there is a microscopic layer of impurities, and you're going to ingest some of that every time you use your utensils. So what's the answer? What's the solution? Well, it's a pretty easy one. Though it's not the most obvious solution, and to some seems like overkill. Suppose you want a drink of water. You grab a cup. You put pure water in it. Well, if it's a cup around the house you washed in tap water and let dry, the microscopic crud that it's accumulated on the surfaces of the cup is re-dissolved in the pure water and you end up drinking it. So the obvious but impractical solution would be to wash everything with purified water. Impractical because of the volumes of pure water that you'll need. Imagine if you have an automatic dishwasher, you have to hook it up then to your purified water system. And no home water purification system I know of has that kind of flow, the volume, the gallons per minute. So here's what I do, here's the hack. I wash my dishes in the sink with tap water And I rinse them with my purified water that comes out of a spigot that's mounted alongside the sink. Though that means your water purification system can't come out in dribbles and drops. It's got to have a pretty good flow. Or else you'd be standing around rinsing dishes all day. So then what about when you have dinner at other people's houses or restaurants and hotels, etc.? Well, you're stuck. You're on your own. 
But, you know, everything in this world is about concentration and exposure. So if you only go to a restaurant once or twice a week and 90% or more of the meals you eat are at home where you do things properly, well, it's like being exposed to anything toxic. It's all about the concentration and the frequency. After all, every time you walk out of the house, you've got no control of what you're breathing in. Pollen, dust, diesel, and car fumes. But once back in the house, you have a lot more control over the situation. Like having an inexpensive HEPA filter. You talked about that in a previous show, Johnny. There are a lot of good ones out there for around 100 bucks. Though now that I've opened that particular can of worms, there's something else about water people never consider. The actual cooking of food in water. It's a fact that almost everyone uses tap water to cook. Do you know of anyone who uses ultra-pure water to cook? I do, but it's like one out of a thousand. Well, Johnny, that's one to think about for a while. Because obviously, whatever nasty chemicals and pollutants are in your water are going to get infused into your food when you cook with it. And yes, I know you can get carried away with all this stuff. You can get carried away with anything. But at least we have great water purifier systems and the means and the knowledge to minimize it. You like everything else, it can't be avoided completely, nor should we want to. Some exposure to contaminants is necessary to gear up your immune system, especially when you're younger. So maybe it's not such a good thing that kids today don't get muddy, play in sandboxes, and eat dirt. But I'm digressing, Johnny. My point is to say you need a good purifier in your house and you should rinse your dishes right away with pure water. And if you think I'm eccentric, you think I'm going overboard, you think I'm an alarmist, well... 22 years in a big city water department lab will do that to you. Signed, Carvin. All right, Carvin, there doesn't seem much I can add to that, except to say if you want the plans for my own under-counter three-stage water purification system, send me an email, theexpatfiles at gmail.com. So again, it's three filters, three stages. First one being a particulate filter. The second, a ceramic cartridge filter that's impregnated with silver. That's the expensive cartridge, but it can last a lifetime if you take care of it nicely because it's renewable. And finally, stage number three, a carbon block filter, solid carbon. It takes out the chlorine, most of the fluoride, and all the thousands of nasty organic chemicals that are in today's water supplies. It's the system I have under my sink in the kitchen, and it's somewhat portable too if you're moving to another place. It's got its own faucet spigot, and the water flow is pretty fast. It comes out in a stream about a quarter inch wide and fast enough to fill a gallon of water in about 30 seconds. Of course, after about six months or so, the stream starts diminishing, but that's your signal to clean or change the filters. So anyway, if you want my complete plans and diagrams and photos of my own system, one that you could surely put together yourself, even if you're a mediocre do-it-yourselfer for under 100 bucks, send me an email, theexpatfiles at gmail.com. All right, let's take the second part of... Frankie's email about the epoxy. We talked about that, I think, two shows ago. This will be of interest to you because you're going to use this stuff all the time. I find a million and one uses for this double-barrel epoxy myself. He says, Dear Johnny, your November 27th show, you talked about two-barrel epoxy, which is good for gluing things together and is highly durable. Unfortunately, you didn't mention a particular brand available in Guatemala or Central America. I tried a brief search online. However, some people have negative reviews for the brand Loctite, which is sold down here. And even the U.S. brand Gorilla Epoxy has some bad reviews. What available brands do you recommend, Johnny? Something that'll bond plastic, wood, steel, and concrete. All right, Frankie, I guess you could say I'm kind of an expert on epoxy. I use it all the time. Plus, in various construction jobs, I've even used the industrial-grade stuff where you get two quart cans of this stuff and that's your two parts you mix them together and then within 10 minutes man it's rock solid but i'll tell you the limitations of this stuff you can't bond concrete forget about it you could try and it won't last if it takes any pressure or stress on it and this is really important you can't use epoxy anywhere it's going to get warm or hot and i've noticed on amazon you talk about the reviews about gorilla double epoxy and various other double barrel epoxies Almost all the negative reviews come from people who use it beyond its limits. Like I said, never for concrete, never when it's subjected to heat. I'm talking about something, you know, over 120 degrees, let's say. Because then it'll get a bit soft and lose its strength. So pretty much any double barrel or two-part epoxy is okay, even the generic brands. In fact, there's one in Latin America I use all the time. It's called Poxipol, P-O-X-I-P-O-L. It's a two-part epoxy. It comes in tubes, though. 
it's not a combined double barrel unit where you just press the plunger. You got to actually mix it together. The stuff is clear and it's very strong. Cheap as dirt too. Comes in various sizes too. The smallest being somewhat like a tiny tube of toothpaste. And you know, for small repairs like a ceramic knick-knack, let's say, or two pieces of plastic to mend, I just squeeze a little bit out of each one on a piece of paper and use a toothpick to mix it and use that same toothpick to apply it. And then you just cap off the tubes and they're good for a year or two before they start drying and hardening up in the tube. But that's to be expected. Just like a paint can that's been opened. By the way, the headphones I've been using, they're Plantronics headphones. They're about 200 bucks a pair. Well, about six months ago, I ended up sitting on them. And I broke the plastic support band that goes over the top of your head and connects the two earpieces. Thankfully, though, the wires inside were not damaged. But now I'd never be able to use them again. So, went into my junk drawer, pulled out my double-barreled epoxy, fused the two broken pieces of plastic together, Waited a couple hours till the joint was good and hard, then laid another double coating on top of it, and I've been using those things ever since. Not a problem. They're as solid as can be, though I do have my fingers crossed. Oh, and here's a really neat trick. If you've opened a paint can, sealed it, and you want the remnants in that can to still be good after a few years. Well, here's what you do. Before you close up the paint can, you take a piece of saran wrap or clear plastic wrap and seal it over the top. You put the lid back on. You seal it nice and tight, maybe whack it a few times with a hammer. Then you store your paint can on your shelf or counter, whatever, upside down. Can you picture that? Now, I've used this method a lot. I'll tell you what. I've had old paint in a can last five, even ten years like that. So keep that in mind. As for your own paint jobs, well, try that little trick and you'll be glad you did. Oh, and one last really important trick if you're moving here to Latin America, whether you're buying a house or renting. You will, I guarantee you, want to fill your walls with mirrors, paintings, shelves, etc. But it ain't that easy. You have to understand it's not like in the States where you have stick wood construction. We're talking cement walls here. So you'll have to have some concrete bits and a hammer drill. Could be a cheap drill with a hammer function, but you'll need it. And then, of course, in a cement wall, you'll put plastic anchors and then put your screw in, right? To hold up the picture or whatever. Well, here's the problem, folks. If you just whack a plastic anchor in a hole you've drilled in a wall, it's pretty much a guarantee, especially if the thing's heavy, that in a year or so it'll come loose. I'm sure you've experienced the same thing up north if you've ever had to drill a hole and hang something in a cement or block wall. But there is a cheap and dirty solution to that anchor getting loose problem. You can, with one simple step, make that anchor last more than your lifetime just by a tube of liquid nails or equivalent. It comes in various sizes, and I never buy the small tubes, you know, the ones that look like toothpaste tubes, because once you use those things once and put them in a drawer, they're solid in a month. It's almost impossible to use what's left in the rest of the tube for another repair job. But if you buy a caulk gun size tube, so you'll need a $3 caulk gun too. So you buy a caulk size tube of liquid nails or equivalent for 3 or 4 bucks. Then right after you drill your hole in that cement or block wall, You blow out the dust. Best way to do that, with a straw. Yep, a drinking straw. Just stick a straw in that hole, blow, and you'll get all the dust out. Of course, it'll blow in your face. A minor inconvenience. Because what you're going to do then, you'll squirt a dab of liquid nails or equivalent in that hole. And then pound your anchor in. Of course, that means you'll have to wait a couple hours or even overnight before you put the screw in the anchor to hold up whatever you're holding up. But once it does, man, it's bonded that anchor to your wall permanently. But don't forget to blow the dust out of the hole first. That's important. So what I do is I take a plastic straw. Those are illegal now, right? They'll put you in jail in California if you're caught with one. Hey, Juanito, what you in for? Oh, manslaughter. How about you? Doing five years, man, got caught by the plastic straw police. Oh, no chit, vato. Tough break. Don't you just hate putting paper straws in your mouth? Man, what's the world coming to? Gives me the willies. <laughs> anyway, I just take one of those generic jumbo straws that's got ribs on it. You know, the type you can put a bend or a kink in? I know, I know, plastic straws are illegal now, but you should be able to get them on the black market or from your neighborhood crack dealer. Anyway, if you can get a hold of that kind of contraband, you can do what I do. I blow out the dust every time I drill a hole in a cement, block, or concrete wall. The other problem is that we often over-drill those holes so that plastic anchor is sloppy in there, right? 
I know it's a crappy feeling, but don't despair. All is not lost. The cool thing is that liquid nails will take care of that problem nicely. Once it hardens, man, it's dead rock solid. Oh, and another great hack or trick if your anchor is sloppy in the hole, take a toothpick or two, yeah, again with the toothpicks, and jam one or two of them in alongside the anchor. Oh, and by the way, all the decent contractors, guys who build houses and apartments and office buildings here in Latin America, they're always drilling holes in walls and putting anchors in them for various things. And when they have to put in a big anchor, it's a metal one, not a plastic one. Sometimes they use those expansion anchors. You know, it's a metal job and you whack it with a big heavy hammer and it expands into the hole that you just drilled. Yet even those, and that's a great idea, will end up getting loose over time. That's why the good contractors down here will have some of that epoxy on hand or a tube of liquid nails and do exactly as I mentioned before because they know better. They don't want callbacks a year or two later when that deck they built in the backyard and attached to a concrete wall starts pulling away and loosening up. You get the picture. So when I say double barrel epoxy, I just mean two-part epoxy. It could be two bottles or a syringe with two barrels built into it. You can go on Amazon. They've got dozens of two-part systems, but they sell it in large quantities, which is overkill for home use. They sell it by the quart, half gallon, and gallons. You won't put a dent in that unless you plan on living 200 years. Anyway, I just thought I'd say way too much about the subject because you will run into that problem, I guarantee you. Like I said, the walls down here are not wood 2 by 4 construction. They're cement, concrete, and block. You need to know how to deal with it, and you don't want to have to call a carpenter or a stonemason every time you want to hang a shelf or put up a bathroom cabinet. Not that it would cost you an arm and a leg like it would up in the States if you called somebody in. It won't. It'd probably cost you 20 bucks. Problem is, this is Latin America, and if the carpenter says he'll be here tomorrow morning at 8, all that really means is you'll have to stay home all day tomorrow and probably the day after, too, because he's not going to show up at 8. Not tomorrow. All right, now, you remember a couple of shows ago, I talked about the problems you might have at the airport if you have some medical equipment to bring with you while you're traveling. Hey, people have all kinds of devices these days, you know, sleep apnea machines, insulin pumps, Stephen Hawking, autographed wheelchairs. Anyway, our expat insider, repeat offender Jen, sent us a nice list last time that we highlighted. However, there are a few additional points worth mentioning. If you're going to bring any medical equipment with you, Number one, it must be packed separately from your regular baggage for two reasons. To prevent people from taking advantage of the fact that medical equipment is being flown for free. Airlines do that, you know. But some people try to piggyback on that. And if you get caught, you'll be paying for an extra bag, which is at least 100 bucks. And as Jen says, don't try to be slick and add a t-shirt or an extra pair of socks or underwear in the case with your medical stuff. The moment that happens, the airlines have every right to charge you for an extra bag. Hey, I know about extra charges for bags and strange stuff. I've had to pay a hundred bucks here and there to bring amplifiers and guitars with me on airplanes. And of course, if it's over the weight limit, I think it's something like 45 pounds now, you'll pay an extra charge, which is usually the extra bag fee too, of a hundred bucks or so. Plus, and this has happened to me, they send you to another part of the airport to pay for that overweight or extra bag. And sometimes there's a line. It could take 20 minutes, a half hour, even an hour to get that extra bag processed. And by then, your flight may have timed out, and then you'd be SOL. That happened to me once. I think it was in Costa Rica. Oh, and another thing. Jen tells us that sometimes TSA will want to inspect your equipment. Sometimes they'll take the whole thing apart, and there's nothing you can do about it. And they may not be able to get it back together correctly. And also, and this is important, include in your bag of medical equipment a letter from your doctor stating the reason why you need this stuff and a manual for the medical equipment too. Because sometimes TSA will question you as to why you have this stuff. And your easiest answer is just to show them the letter and then you're on your way. And the other reason to have the manual is so that TSA, if they take it apart, will have a guide as to how to put it back together. And it stands to reason you want to have a hard copy of the manual Sure, you can pull it up on your cell phone, but that's not quite adequate. Why? Because the screen is so small. It could be a pain to read, and not only that, you might not have internet or access to the website where the manual is located when you need it. So you have to kind of assume those TSA guys and government slugs have below average IQs. 
Seems to me, though I could be wrong, the IQ of most government workers is inversely proportional to their net weight, with two notable exceptions being Bush Jr. and Biden. Have you noticed the massive expansion of the size, girth, and spread of airport workers in the last, let's say, 20 years? Most look like heart attacks waiting to happen. And you want to trust these guys with your health care system? Anyway, as more and more people travel with medical equipment, you're going to need to know that stuff. Oh, and by the way, I'm sure most of you out there are taking vitamins and supplements. And when you're traveling, you want to bring that stuff with you. And believe me, if you're taking five or ten different things, you don't want to bring five or ten different bottles, do you? So here's what I do. I line my bottles up on the counter. I take photos of them, real photos. I have them in my phone gallery. I don't have to look them up on a website. Then I take an empty vitamin bottle and I put a new label on it with tape. I scribble the names of all the pills in the capsules on that tape. I calculate how many I'll need for the trip. I throw them in there. And thus, I have one bottle with all my vitamins and supplements in it. And I bring that with me on the plane in my carry-on luggage. And you know, some airlines these days charge you for stored luggage. So if you can get away with just having a carry-on piece of luggage, you can save 50 or 100 bucks. So anyway, you can bring your vitamins and supplements on the plane with you. But of course, not massive quantities. They'll stop you for sure. Just enough for your trip. Oh, and do avoid bringing powders with you. Now, I take some powders like vitamin C and magnesium, and I also have them in capsule form. Those are the ones I take with me on trips. The powdered stuff is for home. Oh, and don't forget, TSA and other government slugs really jump on you if you try to bring liquids on board the plane. So skip liquid vitamins or supplements unless you have a prescription. So for a trip, just bring pills and capsules and label them like I do. However, the rules are much more relaxed if you put your vitamins and supplements in your stowed luggage. They almost never say a thing, even if you've got powders and liquids, as long as you have them marked and they're not in gigantic quantities. And so far, and I travel a lot, no one's messed with me. But I make sure I never bring any powders with me. Don't want to push my luck. All right, now just a few words to you longtime listeners out there who say that you don't think your money's going to last. When you finally get down here to Latin America, you'll have a little nest egg, but you think you'll have to work. Find a job or a niche eventually. Well, I don't want to say I told you so. I don't want to sound like a pompous ass. But I know lots and lots of you listeners have been with me from the very start of this program, a little over 10 years now. And I'm sure you remember way back in late 2013, about seven years ago now, I mentioned this stuff on the air on the show called Bitcoin. I mention it because I'm continuously getting emails from people saying, Johnny, what are expats and gringos doing to secure their future? Since we all know the U.S. and the worldwide fiat system is technically bankrupt and can't last. So in 2013, I first mentioned Bitcoin as something very smart and astute gringos and expats were starting to get involved in. So how did I hear about it? Well, from some very brilliant techies that came down to my early seminars. So it was 300 bucks a coin in 2013 when I first mentioned it. Meanwhile, I'd continuously get emails from people asking, what are gringos and expats investing in? So then I mentioned it again in 2014 when it was around 600 bucks. Then in 2015, it dropped down to around 200 something and people sent me emails saying, Johnny, ha ha, it's a scam, it's a Ponzi scheme. Then came 2017 and I mentioned it again when it was around 1200 bucks. And people still hit me up with emails saying, Johnny, it's fantasy, it's air, it's backed by nothing. Yeah, right, like the US dollar ain't. And then suddenly it shot to the moon, hit almost 20,000 bucks, and just as quickly took a dump, all the way down to a little over 3,000 bucks for a while. And people said, Johnny, it's too volatile, I'll never get into that stuff, it's dead. But I didn't back off, I said, be patient. That's what all my brainy tech friends were saying. People a lot smarter than me, people I know personally, were saying, be patient, hang in there. Wait till the world of non-techies catches on to this, and they will. In fact, I remember during some of my seminars back then, after meeting and hearing Bitcoin Dan and Oscar Miner give their presentations on crypto, quite a few people during seminar breaks bought some Bitcoin between 1200 and around 2000 bucks. Now, I don't know if they were patient and held on to it, but if they did, they caught a tiger by the tail. And now that it's back up to all-time highs, around 18 and 20,000 bucks. Well, I've been getting a steady trickle of emails from those same people telling me that never ever in their lives did they have an investment that earned them 10 
to 20 times their initial investment. Now, you know the rule of sevens, of course, right? That means if you have 100 bucks, let's say, in an interest-bearing account of 7%, it takes roughly seven years to double your money. That's the rule of sevens. So let me ask you this. Where can you find an investment that pays 7% a year? Well, you won't get it with the traditional stuff, banks, CDs, or treasuries. They're all around 1%. Oh, and have you heard the rule of 72? That's also a good little trick to know. How that works is you take the interest you're making per year on a CD or bank account, whatever, and you divide it into 72, and that tells you how many years it will take for you to roughly double your money. For example, if you've got 100 bucks in an account at 3%, you divide 72 by 3, and you get 24 years to double your money. So if you've got a CD at 1%, you divide 72 by 1, it takes 72 years to double your money at 1% interest. Of course, in the first year or two, inflation will eat you right up. So even if your money doubles in 72 years, it won't be worth dick. But you knew that already, right? So you might ask, now that Bitcoin's at its all-time high again, will it dump again or go to the moon? Well, the word from all those techie guys smarter than I am is, be patient, and you will be well rewarded, even at today's prices. They are talking about within the next year or two, another gigantic leap into the stratosphere because the big investment houses are seeing the dollar crash. And they've got to make a certain return on their money or their clients will be really pissed and leave them. And the thing is, for the last 10 years, Bitcoin has outperformed every single asset class spectacularly. In fact, this very minute as I record this show, 97% of all the people who ever bought Bitcoin in its 11 years of existence are in the black now. They're in the money. Even the people who bought at the extreme top in 2017. Now, of course, this is not investment advice. I'm just telling you what some of the smartest people I know are saying and doing. So you can either put your faith in them or put your faith in the, the idiot politicians, government economists, and the Fed who got us in to this huge financial Ponzi scheme, fiat funny money mess. Wait a minute. I forgot. It totally slipped my mind. Biden will fix everything. Right? And you know why I know that's true? Just look at how many fantastic and amazing things he accomplished in his 47 years as a senatorial and vice presidential swamp creature. I hope everyone's happy now because, you know, you get the government you deserve. Man, am I glad I got the hell out of Dodge. By the way, how's your plan B coming? Just saying. South of the border, You've been listening to The Expat Files, living in Latin America. If you need some help with your own Plan B, we can schedule a one-on-one -on -one phone or Skype consult. Just send me an email, theexpatfiles at gmail.com. And if you want to get on the waiting list for my next week-long expat insider seminar in Central America, where you're guaranteed to get a two- to five-year head start on your Plan B, send me an email, theexpatfiles at gmail.com. Nos vemos.